Our next speaker is a New York Times bestselling author of Unintended Consequences and a former managing director of Bain Capital. Please help me welcome Ed Kennard. <laughs> My book, uh, Unintended Consequences, tries to explain why the U.S. economy was successful prior to the financial crisis, what happened in the financial crisis, and what we can and can't do in the aftermath of the crisis to return to the growth trajectory that we had uh, prior to the crisis. Um, it was featured on the New York Times uh, Sunday Magazine uh, under the title, uh, uh, Are the Rich Worth a Damn?, which caused a lot of journalists and politicians to clamor to debate me. It included uh, Elliot Spitzer, Barney Frank, uh, Joe Stiglitz, uh, even John Stewart. Uh, and all of that attention drove the book uh, to number nine on the New York Times bestseller list. But what was overlooked and what went under the radar screen is the growing support that the book has achieved from the academic economic community. Greg Mankiw, the former head of the uh, Council of Economic Advisors, said the book was far smarter than most books written for the general public on economics. Tyler Cowen and uh, the American Enterprise Institute both said it was a must-read book of the year. Um, Steve Levitt, the author of Freakonomics, said the book contained an amazing number of good ideas. And uh, Andre Schlaefer said it was the most cogent and persuasive analysis of the financial crisis to, uh, to date. I think people uh, don't fully appreciate the success of the U.S. economy since the commercialization of the Internet in the early 1990s. And I think comparisons to Europe and Japan help us see just how successful our economy was. So the U.S. productivity accelerated from 1.2% a year growth to about 2% a year. We achieved about 2.3% a year growth in productivity after World War II, so we got back almost to the same levels of productivity growth. Well, Europe and Japan's productivity did the opposite. It was up in the high ones, it fell to the low ones. The United States grew in total about 63% from 1991 to 2011 today. France grew 35% over that time, Germany 22%, Japan 16%. Uh, GDP per worker in France, Germany, and Japan had gotten to about 85 to 90% of the U.S. It has fallen back to about 75% of the U.S. And today, median incomes in the United States are 25 to 30% higher than they are in uh, Germany, France, and, and Japan. Now, there's a, a, a belief that this success didn't translate to gains for the middle class. But in fact, middle class income in total grew an enormous amount, and that led to uh, employment gains in our economy that were not achieved in other economies. We grew our employment 40% since 1990 on a base of 100 million workers. Europe and Japan grew less than half as fast. Half of those jobs were created at the highest end of the wage scale. Uh, we now have today 35 to 40 percent more hours of work per working age adult uh, than Germany and France have. Contrary to popular belief, we did not outsource, we insourced, we pulled 20 million immigrants into our economy, and we employed tens of millions of people, uh, uh, put them to work offshore. No other high wage economy has done more for the world's middle class and working poor than the U.S. economy has over the last two, uh, two decades. Now, Europe had access to the same technology in Japan, uh, and they had similarly educated workforces. Why weren't they able to achieve the gains that the United States was able to achieve uh, prior to the financial crisis? I believe there's three major differences between our economy and theirs. The first is we have lower labor redeployment costs. It costs less to fire and, and workers and redeploy them. The second is we have more open trade borders, and the third is we have higher payoffs for successful, uh, successful risk-taking. How do the first two affect the United States? I think it, but most people don't realize, but the introduction of CNC, computer program machines, and uh, lean manufacturing technology uh, really boosted productivity in manufacturing in the United States in the 1980s and the 1990s. Three quarters of the lost manufacturing jobs have come from domestic productivity gains, not from outsourcing, which is believed to be the common reason for our, our decline in manufacturing. Now, at the same time, we also gained access to very cheap offshore labor, which we were able to put to work on our behalf. And at the same time, Europe and Japan were working hard. Their most talented people were working hard to avoid high-cost layoffs because they had much higher labor redeployment costs. And so the U.S. made a very quick transition from manufacturing into the service economy, and our most talented people were freed up to work on more innovative ideas, which largely revolved around the Internet at a time when the Internet was commercialized in, uh, in 1993. 
So in the face of these, these changes, higher payoffs for successful risk-taking drove more risk-taking in the United States than we saw in, uh, in Europe and Japan. If you go back to the 1950s and 60s, large-scale capital investments were really growing the U.S. economy because we knitted our economy together into large mass markets with interstate highways and, and television. Today, it's really the talent uh, and risk-taking of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial companies which, which drives our growth. And this uh, increase in risk-taking had a compounding effect on our economy, which really spread these gains quite widely through our economy. The first is success raises the bar for success. The most talented people in the United States are working much longer hours than their counterparts in Europe who have uh, declined in the number of hours that they've worked over time. Our most talented students today don't want to be doctors and lawyers. We, have, we produce many more MBAs than, uh, than Europe and Japan does. Um, and so what you see is people today, they don't want to be doctors and lawyers. They want to be, take the entrepreneurial risk which draw our, grow our economy. Their success created companies like Google and Facebook and countless other companies that, that go unnamed, which really give our workforce much more valuable training than the workforces in Europe and Japan. And that has increased the workforce's probability of success and led them to take more entrepreneurial risks than we have seen in, in the other countries and success creates equity and puts that equity into the hands of entrepreneurs who are far more willing to underwrite the risk of innovation that produces the growth that we have, that we have uh, seen in our economy. It's no surprise we see much higher levels of equity per GDP and per worker in the United States than we see in, uh, in Europe and Japan, and as a result, we take more risk and produce more of the, the innovation. There's a second thing that these two decades have shown us as well, and that is that increases in assets produce uh, changes in the behavior of our families. They take more risks, they consume more money. We saw that in the real estate boom of 2007, uh, and we also saw it in the 1990s when the NASDAQ rose from about 800 to 4,500. People feel richer, they're willing to spend more money, they're willing to take more risks, they're willing to make, uh, make more investments. Now, the trade deficit contributes to this increase in asset values. In a closed economy, what you find is that when asset values rise and households turn to sell assets in order to increase investment and consumption, asset prices drop, production prices rise, return on investment declines, and the economy is brought back into equilibrium. And that dampening of force has been bringing our economy, our closed economy, into equilibrium for a long time. But in an open economy with a trade deficit, where trade partners are using their dollars to buy assets, Instead of goods, it drives up the price of assets, it drives down the cost of production because they're willing to work for a dollar an hour, the return on investment increases instead of decreases, and it, it, families are spurred to consume more and to invest more, and we have unlimited offshore capacity to satisfy those needs, and so we're able to continue growing the economy as our trade deficit, our trade deficit expands. Uh, now, but this dynamic brings financial risk into our economy. Uh, I think about a simple corn economy. You can eat the corn, that's consumption. You can plant the corn, that's investment. Or you can hoard the corn in silos. Um, and if you hoard the corn, you'll get a much smaller and slower growing economy with much higher unemployment. You have to get the corn out of the silos and lend it back to investors or consumers if you want to grow the economy as fast as you can grow it, make it as large as you can, and get the employment as low as possible. Now, when we, what we find, though, is that our offshore trade partners are very risk-averse. They want to buy government-guaranteed debt. Those are the assets that they choose to buy in our economy, not the assets that underwrite business risk. And that pushes risk-averse savers, who otherwise would have bought government-guaranteed debt, into the private sector, which is riskier, and they shorten up the duration of their savings and their loans in order to compensate for the increased risk. What we saw was a large buildup of institutional deposits in our banking system. Um, and banks are really the vehicle through which the corn in the silo is recirculated as back into our economy as either investment or consumption. And so to maintain full employment, we have to find a way to put these savings to work. And the way we did that was by uh, loaning uh, to households uh, 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 subprime mortgages, and they used the proceeds from, those, uh, from the gains in real estate to fund consumption, which was largely produced, to, produced offshore, and that got the corn out of the silos and back into circulation into our economy. Now, there's common misunderstandings about what happened in the financial crisis, which I think lead to a, a misdiagnosis. 
Loan losses didn't uh, uh, bankrupt our banking system. Withdrawals did. So banks really didn't make no money down loans. They went out and they found investors to make down payments on behalf of homeowners. And they did this by selling the subordinated tranches and securitizations to outside investors, the non-AAA tranches. And so from the AAA perspective, from the bank's perspective, it didn't matter whether a homeowner made a 20% down payment or a subordinated lender put up 20 or 30% of the capital. Either way, the bank was protected from a 20% drop in real estate. We had a 30% drop in real estate prices. If you look at the Federal Crisis Inquiry Commission, it estimates the losses on subprime finance will be about $300 billion. All of those losses have been suffered by the subordinated tranches and securitizations, and those tranches have largely owned by non-bank investors. If you look at the losses expected in AAA, they're expected to be zero. So when you really look at what happened in the financial crisis, what you see is that withdrawals rendered banks insolvent. Institutional investors withdrew about $1.5 trillion from the banking system, despite $15 trillion of government guarantees. Had the guarantees been less, the withdrawals would have been much, much larger. And assets, as, as banks are selling assets to fund withdrawals, assets sink to fire sale prices, and the banks aren't able to fund withdrawals at fire sale uh, prices. And so they're rendered insolvent as a result. Now, this phenomenon is well understood by economists and policymakers, even if it isn't well understood by the, the public. And that is that short-term deposits, overnight deposits, which can be withdrawn from the silo very, very quickly, are highly unstable. And withdrawals will logically cascade to 100%, no matter what the size of the loan losses are, because I have to race you to get to the bank to withdraw my money before the bank is rendered insolvent from the withdrawals. The mistake that was made is that we believed that implicit government guarantees would hold the deposits in place. And those guarantees, and the reason we believe that is because we hadn't seen withdrawals since 1929, so we just assumed that this system of implicit guarantees would, would hold the money in place. Now we recognize there's enormous risk of damage from withdrawals, and the money sits idle unused now in our banking system to fund the possibility of withdrawals and to avoid the damage. So there's three things we've tried to do which I think make the problem worse, not better. The first is we can threaten the banks with insolvency from withdrawal. That's what happens in a too big to fail, for example. And the banks have little choice but to leave the deposits sitting idle, available to fund the withdrawals in case that they happen. And I say, well, why would we ever suffer permanent recession to avoid intermittent recession? We need to get the corn out of the silos. And this is the reason why monetary policy hasn't worked. The Fed drops the interest rate to zero. They flood the market with liquidity. They dare anybody to use hair-triggered short-term debt, as if nobody learned their lesson the last time. The money sits in the banking system idle, and we all scratch our head and wonder why that doesn't work anymore. The Fed has produced about $1.7 trillion of cash, and we see $1.7 trillion of excess reserves in the banking system. A second option is to bolster the banks with more equity. But equity is a zero-sum game. That equity is already underwriting risk in our economy, largely in the business community, creating jobs and growth. If we pull it out of that and put it into the banking system, we're largely using our equity to underwrite the risk of subprime consumption, which we've learned is not, is not sustainable. So equity is really a zero-sum game. And the last thing we often hear is, let's match the duration of loans to the duration of our deposits. But the deposits are very short term, and it takes investors and consumers a long time to pay back their loans. So the only loans that are short term in nature that will match the deposits are loans to financial speculators, which is almost nothing to grow our economy and increase, uh, and increase employment. So one of the things that might work is to strengthen government guarantees rather than to threaten the banks with insolvency from withdrawals. Now, the private sector is unable to make guarantees that are credible enough to hold the deposits in place. The government made $15 trillion of guarantees. There's only $20 trillion of, of equity in our stock market. Uh, and the second thing we ought to keep in mind is that the taxpayers suffered no out-of-pocket expense for having made these guarantees. The government is actually expected to make a profit on the guarantees and the loans it made in the financial crisis. But this solution is probably too radical and will never, never be implemented. And even if we did implement it, we still have to find an alternative to subprime consumption for putting that short-term risk-averse corn back to work. And we really have no alternative. But unless we make guarantees that turn short-term deposits into long-term deposits, it's unlikely that we're going to find them in the short run. And so the, the, the money continues to sit inside of the banking system unused, and we still have slow growth and, uh, and high unemployment. Now, on those conditions, one thing we should recognize is that when our trade partners add corn to the silo, when the silos are already overfilling with corn, rather than buying our goods that employ our workers, that increases their employment at the expense of our employment. 
Now, in the long run, our economy will grow increasingly uncompetitive if we don't, uh, uh, you know, if we try to make for 20 dollars what we could buy for a dollar, because we can use those 19 dollars to hire teachers and truck drivers and waitresses and sales clerks and doctors. So we can't, in the long run, close our, tr our trade borders. But in the short run, I think we have to recognize that a successful partnership requires both parties to bear some of the costs. Our workers can't, in the short run, bear all the costs of, of open, an open trade. And we have a tremendous amount of negotiating leverage because we are both the employer of offshore workers and we are the consumers, the customers, of the products that we choose to buy. Uh, but again, I think that uh, you know, it's unlikely that this alternative will be uh, implemented. And the alternative to this alternative is borrow money from the Chinese and use it for less productive government spending, which really only leaves us, uh, leaves us deeper in debt. So um, again, I'm not optimistic that we have a solution to, to this problem. The last possibility is to accumulate more equity to underwrite the risk that we now see from the risk of withdrawals. Uh, prior to the financial crisis, the value of the stock market reached 140% of GDP, uh, and real estate prices were sky high at the, at the time. In the slow growth of the 1970s and 80s, the stock market was about 50 to 60% of GDP. And so today, we have a lot less equity than we thought we had in 2007, and we need a lot more equity in order to get the economy to grow and take the kind of risks that we were taking prior to the financial crisis. How could the government facilitate that? Now, one solution would be not taxing, redistributing, and consuming the income that would otherwise be invested that reduces incentives for risk taking and it slows the accumulation of equity. But instead, what we have done in the short run is the opposite. We've increased government spending about 30% to compensate for the dial down of the private sector. And we have held uh, tax revenues flat. So we've driven the, the deficit up to about $1.1 trillion a year, which is a number that's, that's hard to understand but we only collect $1.1 trillion a year of income taxes, so you can see how much of a tax increase we would need to cover the, uh, to cover the deficit. And raising uh, uh, taxes on people earning over $250,000 raises about $100 billion a year. Um, and so what this does, the spending, is it leaves an enormous increase in taxes hanging over the head of the economy. So what do rational people do? They look forward into the future, and they recognize that a dollar spent is really a dollar tax. Uh, they see higher taxes, and so they dial back their consumption and investment to compensate. And so in the long run, an increase in government spending is offset by a reduction in the private sector. We've seen that in Europe. You know, Greece is the poster child. The more the government spends, the more the private sector dials back to compensate for that spending. But the problem there is that reducing government spending is likely to lead to a recession because rational people aren't going to dial up their consumption and investment until the government actually cuts because the government has never cut spending in, in the history of the United States. Uh, and then if the private sector responds, it's likely to respond gradually because you know, it, it can't immediately accelerate the, 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 the amount of spending and investment that it's making. And if you increase taxes at this time, you only exacerbate the problem. So you're left with a government consuming the economy's equity to avoid taking the medicine that's necessary to increase the equity in the long run. You get into this catch-22 where we find ourselves today. So, so where does that leave us? I'm optimistic that our entrepreneurial economy can get back on its growth pack if we take the steps that are necessary to fix the structural problems that I've, I've tried to describe. Um, I'm worried that if we don't fix these problems, we'll face a period of, of slow growth and high unemployment which is not to say that we won't grow, but rather that we won't see the kind of rebound that we have seen after, uh, after recessions, which is uh, what's happened so far three and a half years into this. And I see three other problems that concern me as well. The first is that there's a demographic wave of retirees who are going to wash over our economy. They're going to demand a lot more consumption at the expense of increased investment, which grows our equity. Um, I think we all recognize that technological advantages, particularly our advantage in the internet, is short-lived. You can think of companies like Kodak, uh, DEC are gone today. IBM completely transformed by technology. AT&T pretty much has had to transform itself. So these technological advantages and competitive advantages are fragile and short-lived. And the last is that, of course, China continues to grow stronger and more competitive over time. So I would just say our window of opportunity is now. You know, let's not let it pass us by. We should get together and fix these structural problems that are, that are holding back our economy.
<clears throat> thank you, thank you so much, Ed. So, um, so, so your view is that incentivizing risk drives the likelihood of success. And here's a question. So given human psychology, one concern is that boom-bust economics can lead to globally destabilizing panics. And my question is, what would you do to manage that? Yes, well, I think there's, there's two different, you're, you're conflating two issues there. So I believe that uh, uh, innovation is like any game of chance. You have to take a lot of, uh, of you know, 100 tries to find one success. And so the payoffs for successful risk taking drive the amount of risk taking. I don't think that's what causes boom and bust economies. I think that's what maybe you get a little more growth, a little less growth, depending on your willingness to take risk. What drives the boom and bust we have seen in this financial crisis is the withdrawal of short-term risk-averse savings from our banking system. That corn is in the silo. It can be withdrawn at any time, and there are no productive uses for that corn that will allow us to fund withdrawals on a day's notice or a month's notice. We can't unwind the investments and the loans that we've made. That's really what drives the boom and bust. So one thing that worries me is that you say, there is one way to stabilize the economy. Hold a lot of corn in the silo, available to fund withdrawals. But you're suffering permanent recession to avoid intermittent boom and bust. Why would you take a shot of malaria to cure the cold? You'd much rather have the boom and bust, I think. Great. Yeah, it's like the, it's the analogy of keeping society safe by putting everybody in jail, and then you're sure there's no crime that's going to happen. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Um, I, here's a question. You worked with Mitt Romney, and what's something that you can tell us about him that's not widely known? Uh, sure. Um, well... First thing I tell you is the guy is whip smart. I mean, you know, I'm a bit, I'm a mid supporter, so I've, I've tried not to be as partisan as I could be in the talk here. Uh, the second is that he is extremely humble. He is, he recognizes how fortunate he is, and he feels a very strong moral obligation to give back more than he has received. And so, you know, I, I saw on Forbes, they estimated what was the cost of him walking away from bank, bank capital, and they estimated the number, I think, at $1.5 billion. But I think Mitt really is a guy who is thinking constantly about how do I make a bigger contribution than the success that I've achieved and the, the gifts that I've gotten. And I think his approach uh, to the world is, and I think sometimes you see this in the debates and stuff, is to be very humble about the success that he's achieved I think he thinks there's a lot of luck involved with that, and I think it puts a, a tremendous moral obligation on him. He feels that. If you were to date Mitt Romney, what's the one thing that you guys would fight about? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd probably swear, drink, and have sex more. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ed, thank you. Thank you for your work. All right.